Hello class, my name is Demetrius Wilson and I'll be your instructor for Business 5 or Business Law. Uh, this is one of the lectures that I'll do on a weekly basis. This is for, uh, for Chapter 1, the beginning and the basis of law. Uh, this is Business Law, but in order to understand Business Law, we have to uh, first understand law, uh, then add in the understanding of business and, and fuse the two. Uh, the first chapter is the basis of law, uh, the historical and uh, constitutional foundations. Our learning objectives for the chapter are uh, what are the four primary sources of law in the United States, uh, what is the common law tradition, what constitutional clauses give federal government the power to regulate commercial activities uh, among the various states, right, the, the Uniform Commercial Code, uh, what constitutional clauses allows, uh, lo allows laws enacted by the federal government to take priority over conflicting state laws, Right. So you have to, uh, you know, you have to choose between, hey, do we go by the federal law or do we go by the state law and who has the presiding uh, authority? And what is the Bill of Rights? Uh, what freedoms are guaranteed uh, by the First Amendment, uh, the first uh, 10 amendments in the Constitution? Uh, we'll definitely review those in close detail. So business act activities and the legal environment. So it's knowledge of black letter law is not enough that when I say black letter, that's what's written, what you'll see produced in the book and other type of uh, you know, uh, primary and secondary sources of law. That's not necessarily all that you'll need, especially in business when you're talking about things such as ethics, which we'll discuss in chapter two. Uh, many different laws affect a single business transaction. Uh, so it's not just one law. They're all fused in together, especially with the, you know, inventing, uh, invent, you know, and inventing of the internet and computers and techno technology that can, you know, open up a lot of different uh, legal matters. Uh, ethics and uh, business decision making. Uh, so what constitutes uh, right from wrong is, is what ethics is. And, uh, you know, sometimes people, one person can say, I think this is right. The other person can not say, I think this is wrong. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's left up to the court to determine. Uh, sources of American law, uh, you have constitutional law. So it's found in text cases arising from federal and state constitutions. You have U.S. Constitution that's uh, known as the supreme law of the land. Uh, then you have statutory law, uh, laws enacted by federal and state legislatures. Uh, so, you know, they've enacted them, they've created them and put them uh, into use. Uh, local ordinances, uh, we can talk about like, you know, parking, water, things like that, uh, typically uh, managed and handled uh, by the state and down to the city level. And uh, the uniform laws uh, for the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, trade and commerce going uh, from, you know, throughout the interstate. And you'll see a lot of that here in California. We have a, you know, a huge port in Long Beach and, and also one in Los Angeles. Uh, so we see a lot of uh, interstate uh, commerce. Uh, administrative law. This is uh, this is the rulemaking, right? So you think about administrative in school, they make the rules, right? Uh, and administrative law, they uh, make the rules. Uh, orders and decisions of administrative agencies, federal, state, and local. Uh, administrative agencies uh, can be independent regulatory agencies, such as the Food and Drug Administration, right? Otherwise known as the FDA. Uh, you know, you'll see things like, uh, you know, certain products will be put out on the market in GNC. Uh, when the FDA gets around to testing it, they'll find out that these products are actually truly, uh, in the essence, form a steroid and they'll have to take them off the market. But on the business side, what you have to understand is that this company has already made millions of dollars because they've had so many sales. So they don't really care that uh, they took it off the market. And then, you know, some guy named Gus is now selling it uh, on the Internet in his basement. And then adjudication, uh, not in a, in a form or sense of adjudicating a claim like a medical claim, but a, agencies make rules, then investigate and enforce the rules uh, in administrative hearings. Uh, in the early English uh, courts of law, uh, King's Court started after Norman Conquest of, of 1066, established the common law, which is a, a body of general legal principles applied throughout the English uh, empire, right? Uh, King's courts use a uh, precedent uh, to build um, a common law, right? And that's, you know, this is this situation has happened before. So we'll use that. And if we ruled on the fact that, you know, these two individuals, he sold him a car and then the wheel uh, was faulty and the wheel fell off. And so we made him pay for the wheel. That's the precedent uh, for the next case that is just like that. And you'll see one of the videos of Starry Decisis, um, which uh, will we'll, this is the Latin term, but shows you how precedents actually work. And it does, just because it's a precedent does not necessarily mean that the precedent is correct. Uh, there are precedents that, that have been changed, as you'll see with the video of uh, Brown versus the Board, Board of Education. And speaking of stare decisis, uh, practice of deciding new cases based on the precedent. 
A higher court's decision based on certain facts and law is a binding authority. And binding authority means that is the law and that's the one that you cannot break, right? It's binding on lower courts uh, and it helps courts stay efficient. Uh, and those higher courts like the Supreme Court can't come in and say, hey, you know what? This precedent needs to be changed. Uh, equitable remedies in courts of equity. So a remedy, right, just like you have a remedy for a cold, uh, means to enforce a right or compensate uh, for injury to that right. A uh, remedy at law in the king's court, remedies were restricted to damages uh, in either money or property, right? And when you remedy something, like if I had a cold and I remedied the cold, I got better. I got back to my status quo. I didn't think that whatever I took was going to make me feel better than when I initially had the cold. Equitable remedy uh, based on the justice and fair dealing uh, chancery court. Uh, does what is right, specific performance, injunction, or rescission, right? Uh, you know, you sold me a bad car. They're going to make you take the car back and give me back my money. A uh, plaintiff, right? So as you see with, uh, you know, Judge Judy, Judge Wapner, whoever, you, Judge Joe Brown, whoever you used to watch, and they come out, dun, 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 right? That person that goes, uh, comes out and they go to, if you're looking at the TV to the left, that's the plaintiff, right? Uh, if they're staring at the judge, they're on the right. Uh, plaintiff is an injured party initiating the lawsuit and the defendant, dun, 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 they come down and they go to the left or if the judge is looking at them on the right, that's the defendant and uh, they allegedly cause the actual injury. Uh, procedural differences. So uh, initiation of a lawsuit by filing a complaint or by, uh, you know, a action in equity is uh, by filing a petition uh, in a decision you have by a jury or judge uh, and action in equity you have by judge, no jury. So that's something, you know, just a little chart. Uh, for you guys to actually uh, review on your own. Uh, classifications of law. Uh, so you have substantive and uh, procedural law. Uh, substantive law is uh, define and regulate rights and duties. Procedural law established methods for enforcing and protecting rights. Like what's our method? Uh, you know, what's our standard uh, MO or mode of operation in which we must proceed? Uh, civil and criminal law, like, you know, we'll take the OJ case, for example, right? They, you know, he was tried in a criminal ca uh, court case and, uh, you know, won that. Uh, but uh, he did lose a civil case in which you have to pay money. Uh, civil is a private rights and duties between persons and government. Uh, criminal is public wrongs against society. So they say, like, if you do something, you know, criminal against someone, they say that you are committing a crime against uh, against society and not just that person. Uh, national and international law, so national laws of a particular nation, uh, civil versus common law, uh, civil law uh, countries based on Roman code, uh, like a, like in Latin America, and international is a body of written and unwritten uh, observed laws observed by nations when dealing with each other, right? So there's certain written and unwritten laws where, you know, dealing with trade, dealing with imports and exports and things of that nature uh, that we're supposed to follow, but uh, everybody doesn't always follow. Uh, constitutional powers of government. So a federal form of government, uh, the federal constitution uh, was a political compromise between advocates of the state and uh, for sovereignty and uh, central government. All right. So we'll talk about just like in business, you have a centralized business, but then a business that is decentralized, they, you know, they have more power uh, in the smaller units. Uh, and so you, you'll see how, you know, although we are centralized, it's still somewhat decentralized when it comes to certain matters. Uh, separation of power. So you have executive legislative and judicial uh, branches. Uh, they provide checks and balances, right? So one, you know, uh, can't get two, uh, two out of line. So legislative, as it sounds, they enact laws, right? Executive, they enforce the actual laws and judicial, they declare laws uh, and actions unconstitutional or change it to be say that, yeah, this actually is constitutional and reaffirm it. In the Commerce Clause, U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to regulate commerce within foreign nations and among several states. And uh, with the Indian tribes, that's just the actual article, a greatest impact on business uh, than uh, other constitutional provision. Uh, so these are some of the cases like I'm not necessarily going to go over the cases, but um, I want you guys to, to check out those cases like Gibbons versus Ogden, uh, 1824. Chief Justice, Justice Marshall, uh, commerce meant all business dealings that substantially affected more than one state, right? So if the grapes are picked in California and then they're shipped to or uh, up to Oregon, right? then the Commerce Clause would, um, would uh, you know, uh, take precedence over that particular case. Uh, the national government had the exclusive power to regulate interstate commerce. Uh, today, Commerce Clause applies to e-commerce and Internet transactions. Obviously, you have to apply everything in law now uh, to the Internet, to e-commerce and things of that nature. Remember, expansion of national power. So this is Wicker versus Filburn, 1942. Uh, purely local production, sale and consumption of wheat 
uh, was subject to, uh, to federal regulation. Uh, you know, so, you know, some of these cases, uh, you'll find them actually in your textbook. Others, uh, you have to, you know, just look them up. But if you look them up on Google, it's, it's, you'll find so many things on these cases with the, you know, modern invent of the of the Internet and the computers and things of that nature. It's such, you know, easily at our fingertip. If you ask somebody who's been around for a while, they'll tell you, you said to go to the library and, and look through laser fish to, you know, find all kind of things. A classic case. And this is a great one. Heart of Atlanta uh, Motel versus the United States. So. Uh, someone, you know, they were, I believe they're African American and they were coming from, uh, from a different state and wanted to, you know, stay in the hotel and they refused service. Uh, so the motel that provided public accommodations to guests from other states was subject to federal, uh, civil rights legislation. They felt like they had the, cho the choice to say that, no, I don't want you staying in my hotel or motel. Uh, theoretically, the federal government has unlimited control over all business transactions uh, since any enter enterprise uh, can have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And that's theoretically, uh, but that's not necessarily how they would you know, proceed. And it's within practical limits. Supreme Court has curbed few uh, federal um, regulation, regulatory powers in the United States versus Lopez and United States versus Morrison uh, in the year of 2000 as well. Uh, the Tenth Amendment, and like we said, we're going to go over the you know the Bill of Rights uh, reserves all powers uh, to the states that have not expressly delegated uh, to national government. Uh, state have inherent police powers, right? So you're policing your your neighborhoods, your communities, and everything. That's you know the state, uh, and you know the power down to the city. Uh, police powers include right to regulate health, safety, mor or morals, and general welfare, including licensing, building codes, right? You know you have your building codes, your parking enforcement. Uh, parking regulations and zoning restrictions. Uh, dormant uh, commerce clause. So we'll talk about that and and how you can have a positive and or negative effect on uh, interstate commerce. So the United States Supreme Court had interpreted commerce clause to give national government exclusive power uh, to regulate. Right. So if they go in and they see there's a problem between the states, because one state could say, hey, well, we don't want you shipping grapes uh, up to Oregon because we have a grape farm and we're trying to, you know, uh, increase our profit there. Uh, states only have a dormant uh, or a negative power uh, to regulate interstate uh, commerce, right? So if they need to stop certain things because of problems, then they do have the power to do so. Dormant power comes into play when courts balance states in, uh, interests uh, versus natural interests, right? So the interests of the state, like I said, we're trying to, the state's trying to promote and sell all these grapes from this uh, company within Oregon. And uh, the natural national interest is to have free trade and, you know, increase competition and innovation. Uh, the Supremacy Clause, right? So now we're dealing with federal versus state. Uh, Article uh, 6 of um, of the Constitution provides that Constitution uh, laws and treaties of the United States are the supreme law of the land, right? Like the Supreme Court, supreme law of the land. A concurrent, that means that, you know, two things are happening at the same time, right? So if uh, you have lines and they're going straight down the line together, they're running concurrent, right? Uh, one doesn't have to stop for the other one to go. So in few areas, both states and federal government, they actually share the powers. And, uh, you know, who's going to win in that one? Well, typically the federal government is going to win in that in such a such an instance. A preemption when Congress chooses to act in a concurrent area, uh, federal law preempts state law, mm -hmm. just as I just said. Uh, so business and the Bill of Rights in 1791, 10 written guarantees of protection of individual liberties for government uh, from government interference. Originally, the Bill of Rights only applied to federal government. That's just initially. Uh, today, the Bill of Rights has been incorporated and applied to the states as well. Uh, some protections apply to uh, businesses too, right? And that's, you know, something that we'll continue to talk about because it's a business law class. It's not just, you know, a standard law class. Uh, First Amendment is the freedom of speech, right? So we all have the freedom of speech, but we, we must remember that that's not necessarily what people think. I can say whatever I want to say whenever I want to say it and however I, I want to say it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, you know, it, it's within, you know, certain, you know, law and tech uh, courses of, of your right to of freedom of speech. Uh, so right to freedom of speech is the basis of our democratic government. A symbolic speech includes gestures, movements, articles of clothing. Uh, and here are a couple of cases that you can look up. Texas versus Johnson in the United States in 1989. Hodgkins versus Peters Peterson in the Seventh Circuit in 2004. A reasonable restrictions uh, balance government's obligation to protect community uh, versus uh, individuals' right to speech. Right. So if it's detrimental to the community, to the city, to the state, uh, then you know they may uh, side uh, so that they can you know kind of block what that person believes is individual uh, freedom of speech. 
uh, corporate political speech. So corporations have protected political speech, although uh, not to the degree as a, of a natural person, meaning, a, you know, just an individual, a human. Uh, the Supreme Court struck down uh, campaign reform finance laws as unconstitutional. The burden on cur uh on corporate speech, right? So there's another case that you can reference uh, there and, uh, you know, kind of see, especially, you know, in our current political climate, how business uh, can delve into, you know, the political scene and vice versa. Uh, commercial speech uh, is given substantial protection. Generally, the government restrictions must seek to implement substantial government interests, uh, directly advance the interests, and must go no further than necessary to accomplish, right? So you need to go... Uh, you know, to a certain extent, but no further than to accomplish the, the goal at hand. And uh, you want to seek to implement substantial government uh, interests, uh, right, and directly advance that interest. Uh, here's a case, uh, a perfect case uh, in relation to that. Uh, Bad Frog Brewery, uh, New York State, a liquor authority, a version of New York State liquor authority. Uh, denial of label of beer uh, lacked a reasonable fit with state's interest in shielding minors from vulgarity and was therefore un unconstitutional, right? So they say, hey, we're, you know, we have a state mandate that we're trying to protect these kids uh, from seeing vulgar things or things that would induce them to purchase alcohol or cigarettes at a at an earlier age. And, uh, you know, they, they, you know, they have some contention here in that in that case. So if you, you know, checking only a few out uh, throughout the PowerPoint, I would definitely check out that one. So what type of speech is unprotected? Uh, the United States Supreme Court has held that uh, certain speech is not protected. Uh, de de uh, defamatory uh, speech, right? You know, the, if you're saying things about people, uh, you know, that that you shouldn't be saying, especially if those things are, you know, incorrect uh, and, and not true, uh, you're defaming that person, then, you know, that's something that's not uh, that's not protected. Um Threatening speech that violates criminal laws, right? So, you know, you oh, I have freedom of speech, but I say I'm going to go kill Johnny, uh, uh, you know, Appleseed. But that's not something that uh, that you you can do and it's not protected. Uh, fighting words, right? You know what type of words are, are fighting words. Uh, you see in the old movie, all oh, them's fighting words. And I've seen speech uh, is uh, patently offensive, violates community standards and has no literary, uh, literary uh, artistic, political or scientific merit, right? It has no, you know basis it's not anything for the arts uh online obscenity uh you know it's it's so much of that uh protected or unprotected so some of congress attempts to protect children from online pornography and have been ruled unconstitutional restriction on free speech uh communities uh, decency act you'll see reference that in 1996 uh, copa 1998 was challenged in the court children's internet protection act of 2000 uh, which requires that there are filters put on, which I definitely uh, agree with. And uh, what about hate speech uh, on the web? Uh, is that something that's, uh, you know, constitutional or is that covered? Uh, again, you know, those things that are, you know, you're threatening people saying different things, those those things are not covered. Uh, freedom of religion. Uh, First Amendment guarantees that Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, no matter what your religion is. Uh, establishment calls... Um, no state sponsored religion, right? So if you live in, you know, Colorado, you have to be this religion or preference for one religion over another. Uh, and you check out the case uh, in uh, Espis Episcopal Church case uh, 2009. So the secular court can resolve a church uh, properly uh, dispute without establishing a church uh, in the violation of the First Amendment, uh, right? So you cannot mandate that there's, you know, you all have to be this. A free exercise person can believe what they want, uh, but actions may be unconstitutional, right? So you can believe what they want, but if they put certain things into play, then that's not me. So if I believe in, my, you know, or not me, but if somebody believes in that their religion is to, you know, to steal, uh, then obviously that's a crime and it goes against, you know, the beliefs of, you know, others, religions and, you know, the, you know, the law of the land. Now, what about freedom of uh, religion and illegal drug use, right? So some people say, hey, you know, in our religion, you know, we're supposed to, you know, smoke weed and do cocaine and all kind of other things. Obviously, that's something that's not going to be covered uh, within the Muslim faith. Uh, you know, if you have any friends that are, it's religious violation for a woman uh, to appear uh, in public without a scarf or a hijab over her head, right? So for those who don't understand this, it, because, you know, within their religious confines, it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be covered like when out in public, but, you know, when they're home, or, you know, with their husband and they're, they're allowed to take it off. A due process, you always hear about, you know, you know, they have to go through due process uh, procedural. Um, any government decisions to take life, liberty, or property must be fair, right? So if someone gets a death penalty 
or they take their liberty, put them in jail, um, you know, things of that nature, or, or, or take their property because they took someone else's property and they're, you know, they're garnishing or you know, their wages or their property or something like that. Uh, requires notice and a fair hearing, right? Typically, you can't just, you know, well, not here in the United States, they don't just put people to death, right? They obviously go through a hearing and all of that. A substantive uh, focuses on the center uh, or focus on the content or legislation, uh, the right itself. So fundamental uh, right requires a uh, compelling state interest, a non-fundamental rational relationship to state interests. Uh, equal protection, right? We should all have equal protection. A uh, 14th Amendment, uh, a state uh, may not deny to any person within its jur jurisdiction uh, the equal protection of the laws, right? And it, you know, America wasn't always necessarily like that, as you'll see in uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Some of you obviously already know that. Uh, government must treat similarly uh, situated uh, individuals or businesses in the same manner, right? So uh, if a business is, uh, has one, two, and three, and the other business has one, two, and three, you need to treat them uh, equally. Same thing uh, with people. Uh, courts apply different tests, so minimum scrutiny, uh, economic rights, uh, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny of fundamental rights that, that can all be applied. You also have your privacy rights. Uh, Fourth Amendment uh, protects against unreasonable search and seizures. Uh, I remember uh, one, uh, one case that I had a different business law classes where they came with this machine where they can, you know, see all this infrared stuff and they can, you know, catch certain uh, cocaine vapors from, and you know, from sitting outside. And these cops were staking out a place, but they did not have a warrant. So they were just there. And so they thought that by using the machinery on the outside, that that was their warrant and they came in and busted them. But they, you know, said, no, with this machinery, you still need a, a warrant because you didn't have probable cause. You just happened to be sitting outside there and, and maybe got lucky. Uh, and so the guy, you know, ended up not getting busted. Uh, constitutional protection, Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965, found a right uh, to personal privacy implied in Constitution uh, and expanded in Roe versus Wade in 1973 as well. Uh, should be familiar with the USA uh, Patriot Act. That was in 2001. And then also HIPAA, because uh, we all should, you know, should have health insurance of 1996 as healthcare privacy, right? Can't be, you know, passing information uh, around, uh, especially if it's not yours. And that's it for uh, chapter one. The only things, uh, as I post this, is just the appendix, so we'll have different things there. Uh, not, not necessarily anything that I'm going to go over, but if you want to go back and review it, that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, shows you like the national reporting system uh, as well. So a couple of great things in there uh, for you to check out. Uh, but uh, I want you to follow, you know, the clear instructions of just going to the Canvas course, going into uh, the actual Chapter 1 module, uh, taking the Chapter 1 quiz, also watching the three supplemental videos, and then uh, completing your homework assignment on those three uh, supplemental videos. Not all three, but just the one that you choose to write about. Uh, so that's it for Chapter 1. Um, hope we have, uh, I know that we're going to have a great semester uh, in business law. And uh, whatever other classes that you're taking here at uh, here at Southwest College, uh, so look forward to having a fantastic semester with you guys. Remember, uh, don't procrastinate. It's the thief of time. Stay on top of everything and, and make sure that you get your uh, task uh, accomplished and completed each week. I want you all to have a good day and a great week.